Hi, okay, let's take a look at chapter eight, part two, enzymes. And we're continuing our ideas of related to energy, enzymes, and metabolisms. Because so you remember that enzymes are biological catalysts. They speed up chemical reactions without being changed themselves. Oftentimes we'll be talking about proteins that are enzymes. Okay, so specialized proteins, they have a specific shape and they can carry out specific chemical reactions without being changed themselves. Now, not all proteins are enzymes, and not all enzymes are proteins. There's also RNA, which can be enzymatic. Okay, but the majority of the enzymes we'll be talking about are proteins. So how does an enzyme work as a biological catalyst? What does that even mean? So if we look at this graph, let's look at the blue line first. This blue line is a chemical reaction, some sort of reactants that are going to we we'll start with. Okay, so let's pretend we have a disaccharide. Okay, it's made up of two monosaccharides. Okay, and that's going to be broken down into its subunits. So it's exergonic. It's going to go from that as the reactants to the products. Okay, now these disaccharides will eventually break down over time. In order for it to happen, there's a certain amount of energy that has to be put in to break this bond. Okay, so if you had these in a solution and you heated them up, eventually they'll be broken down. You're supplying heat and that gives us this initial energy required to carry out the um, chemical reaction. That initial energy required for a chemical reaction is called activation energy or E sub A. Okay, so inside our cells, if we have a disaccharide and we want to break it down into its components, we could heat it up and that would be great, except it would damage our cells. It would also break down all lots of molecules, not just this disaccharide. So we need something that's more specific and doesn't require the input of that much heat. So what we use are enzymes. So what an enzyme would do is it would bind to this disaccharide specifically and it would cleave this bond, all right? And it would create our products. The way it does that is it lowers the amount of energy required for this chemical reaction to occur. So we say enzymes work by lowering the activation energy. And repeat that to yourself a few times. Enzymes work by lowering the activation energy. Okay, another way to think about it is if you're trying to push a ball over this graph, okay, pushing it up this blue line would take a lot of energy. Okay, but if you're able to use an enzyme to help you out, you have to put less energy in it to get the ball over this hill and down to the products, which we're trying to get to anyways. So enzymes work by lowering the activation energy. So here's an example of an enzymatic reaction. Okay, we have the enzyme in blue, okay? The enzyme is abbreviated E, so that's what we call the enzyme, E. The molecules the enzyme works on is called the substrates, or S. Okay, when the enzyme actually binds to the substrate, it forms a complex called the enzyme substrate complex, or ES. Now note where this substrate's binding. It's binding at a very specific site of the enzyme called the active site. Now the chemical reaction occurs. In this case, we're joining two subunits together and we create a final product. What are we left with at the very end of the reaction? The product, or P, and the enzyme remains the same. And that's a hallmark of enzymes. They carry out chemical reactions without being changed themselves. So we have this equation. The enzyme, E, plus the substrate, S, gives us the enzyme substrate complex and then we end with the final product, but also the enzyme as well. So the enzyme's not used up during this reaction. So you wanna know that equation. So how does the enzyme actually carry out a chemical reaction? How does it help carry out the chemical reaction? Um, so it, chem it catalyzes reaction, and it does this in a number of ways. One is when the substrates bind to the enzyme, it orientates them in such a manner that they're able to connect with each other through a chemical reaction. Okay, so it puts them in the proper f orientation so they fit and they can carry out the reaction. Another way is it can actually induce strain on a substance. So here's a molecule. When it binds to the enzyme, it actually is under pressure, under stress, unstabilized, and it breaks it into its components. And a third way that the enzymes work is it can actually temporarily chemically modify them to encourage the chemical reaction to occur. So there's numbers of ways that enzymes actually help catalyze the reactions once they bind to their substrates in their active site. Take a second just to look at this enzyme and, and appreciate its actual three-dimensional shape of this protein and think back to those levels of folding we learned about proteins.
Now enzymes are important, they carry out chemical reactions, and inside our cells there's lots and lots and lots of chemical reactions going on. So they need to be very highly regulated because you don't want certain reactions to go on uh, when they're not supposed to. You don't want certain enzymes to interfere with other enzymes. Uh, you don't want things to be going haywire. So we have some sort of regulation that's required. And um, there's two main types of regulation. There's irreversible uh, inhibition. Okay, this permanently inactivates. And then the second type we have is actually reversible inhibition. So we can inhibit things permanently, and that works has certain consequences, or things can be uh, inhibited temporarily. So this first type of inhibition, this is irreversible, it's permanent. Okay, so here's an enzyme. This is an enzyme that happens to be part of our nerves. Okay, it helps um, regular function of the nervous system. Here's a substrate called DIPF. Now what's going to happen in this case, when this substrate binds to the active site, it's going to lock in place. And then essentially it blocks down this active site so this enzyme can no longer function the way it does in the nervous system. That's bad, and in fact this, this molecule DIPF is considered a nerve gas because it shuts down the nervous system and has toxic effects on the human body. So that's, in this case, a bad scenario and this an irreversible inhibition because this substrate literally binds and locks in on this enzyme. Now for reversible inhibitions, so these, were, these are types of ways to inhibit enzymes temporarily and they can be reversed. We have one type here called competitive inhibition. Okay, it's called competitive because what happens is some sort of inhibitor competes for the active site. So we have an inhibitor that tries to bind to the active site and if it does, the actual substrate on the right here cannot bind. So it's been out-competed for the active site. If there's more substrate, it will win this race and it will outcompete the inhibitor. Okay. Here's a second type of reversible inhibition called non-competitive inhibition. And in this case, we're not competing for the active site, so it's called non-competitive. Okay. But it's still a type of inhibition. So here we have an inhibitor, but it's called non-competitive because it's not competing for the active site. Instead, it binds to a different location, okay, a control region, and when it does, it causes the enzyme to change shape. So on the right, once this com non-competitive inhibitor binds to somewhere else, the enzyme changes shapes and the substrate can't bind. So it's called non-competitive because the inhibitor and the substrate are not competing for the active site anymore. And this time, the inhibitor binds somewhere else, the enzyme changes shapes, and the substrate can't bind. And this whole reaction has been inhibited. Here we have another type of regulation. It's called allosteric regulation. And allosteric is referring to many different shapes an enzyme can take. And what can happen is the enzymes exist in two forms in this case. They can be an inactive form on the left, okay, or an active form we see on the right. And they can be locked into one of these forms or the other type, okay. So on the left is the inactive form. So we have an allosteric inhibitor. In this case, the allosteric inhibitor binds to a control region, okay, an inhibitor site, and it's going to lock this enzyme in an inactive form. So this, the active site supposed to be right here at the top. We don't see it here because it's inactivated, okay. It's been locked in the off position by the regulator. It can go back uh, <clears throat> and switch over to the active form. So on the right, we have an active form, and we have an activator molecule that binds to the enzyme at a control site and it causes this enzyme to be locked in the active form and they can carry out its chemical reactions. So these are allosteric because it's different shapes the enzyme can take, either an off form, an active form, or an on form, an active form. And they're controlled by these inhibitors. And just note these inhibitors are not binding at the active site. They're binding at different control sites on the enzyme. And one last type of um, regulation Okay, is called end product regulation. Okay, end product regulation. So we saw that enzymes carry out chemical reactions, and that's good. So in this case, we start with a starting material, we end with a ending material, isoleucine, and we need isoleucine. That's a type of an amino acid. But what happens if you have a lot of um, isoleucine? You don't need to make it anymore. So what happens here? The actual end product feeds back. It comes all the way back, 
and it comes up to this first step in the chemical reaction and stops it. So each of these green bars is representing a step in this chemical pathway, okay, a metabolic pathway, and each of these steps is carried out by enzymes. So going from the starting material to an intermediate material, an enzyme does that. Going from the intermediate to the final product, enzymes do that. Now once we start making lots of isoleucine, it accumulates. When it accumulates, it feeds back and it inhibits the first step. So this whole reaction shuts down. What happens when this reaction shuts down? We stop making isoleucine, so the concentration decreases, so there's less isoleucine to feed back, and so this chemical enzyme, this first step, is no longer inhibited, and you start making more isoleucine. So this helps monitor how much of this enzyme we're making. Okay, so that's the main ideas with enzymes from Chapter 8.